show you examples of applications of this theory. Now I have three. The first one has nothing to do with biology. The second one is an extremely naive theory of what we call acting there. And the third one, if I have time to get there, is an extremely naive model for cell motion, keratocyte motion. So the, the first one I think is interesting because it's an extremely generic instability of active systems. So that's what I want to do. So that's what I call continuous motion. That's the component of the molecular field. Now, in this steady state that I'm looking for, I will allow for velocity. The velocity can only be along x, so I will have a velocity v with a component of dx and 0 here. What this means, if things only depend on y, is that the shear gradient matrix only has one non-zero component, dxy or dyx, it's symmetric, and I call that u, it's one half of the dx dy. So what I want to find out is whether there is a solution, steady state solution for this film, which satisfies that. And where everything is at zero. Yes. Would you please move your bag? I can't see that. Yes. <laughs> Very simple. For you. Uh, so the first thing you can write is a force balance again for a long x. So the force balance along x is <coughs> dx sigma xx plus dy sigma yx is equal to zero. It's nothing depend on x, it's just dy, the total stress, 
yx equals 0, which means sigma yx is a constant. There is no stress on the surface, so sigma yx total is equal to 0. There is a subtlety here. I told you yesterday is that this has a component which is anti-symmetric, so I have to be careful whether I write sigma yx or sigma xy. I don't know how to do that, so I would have to go back to my notes every now and then to check that I write the right things. But this one I read recently, so I'm sure it's it. Now, how do I write that? Sigma total yx, I told you yesterday. There's a component which is a pressure, but the pressure is diagonal, so it doesn't contribute. There's this anti-symmetric term, which is the torque. And then there's a symmetric part. This one again. I might like this. And all my derivation yesterday was to relate sigma yx to the velocity gradient and to the other forces. So I will consider that the film is fluid, so I will ignore this elasticity. And in this case, what I call the constitutive equation was just sigma alpha beta plus zeta delta mu two alpha beta plus mu one h alpha two beta. The alpha is equal to two eta. The alpha beta is equal to minus sign here. So that's the general constitutive equation. So I just need to take this, take mm -hmm. the anti-symmetric component, and write this. So I just copy that in my notes. So what this gives is minus h perpendicular for <coughs> eta u, where u is the velocity gradient, minus theta delta u sine of 2 theta plus mu 1 and h parallel. This is the anti-symmetric part of the stress. This is the risk anticipation. I multiplied everything by two, so this is what I did for here. This is the active stress, and this is the coupling between the polarization and the stress. So that's what I get from the stress equation. Yes? You don't have pressure terms. Yeah, this is sigma xy, so the pressure is diagonal. So there is okay, sigma so so xy. But in, in you, do, you don't put a pressure term in your sigma alpha beta. No, it's I mean, here I, I agree. Here yeah, I agree. That's zero. But, uh, oh, in here. No, that's sigma alpha beta. That's the symmetric part, this one. OK. So the pressure would be the total stress. Rate. It's a question of convention. I could write it over So the second constitutive equation that I wrote was an equation for the rate of change of the polarization. Was dp dt contacted derivative of the polarization is h alpha is the gamma one, but this is the rotational field. Gamma one is the rotational velocity, and then there is a term corresponding to this one, which is the effect of the velocity and the polarization. So that's minus mu 1 d uh, alpha beta p beta. So you have to project that into the two components x and y. In the convective derivative, there are three terms. There is a partial derivative with respect to time. I'm looking for a steady state, so this doesn't count. There is a convected derivative. So the geometry just fills it because the velocity is along x and the gradient is along y. So the only thing that remains is the rotational term. So omega alpha beta. Only this one remains. So 
Now, if you do it carefully, what you get is two equations minus u sine theta one over gamma one h x minus mu one sine theta two and u cosine theta equals h y over gamma one minus mu one now what I told you yesterday is that the relevant variables are not hx and xy. This is h parallel and h perpendicular here. h perpendicular is a torque that rotates the polarization. h parallel is this Lagrange multiplier that I need to introduce to make the modulus of the polarization equal to 1. So this one I don't care so much. This one I care about. So you just combine these two equations to introduce h parallel and you will get the equation for h perpendicular so h perpendicular equals gamma 1 1 with mu 1 cosine of the so if I want h parallel this gamma 1 will be 1 So I have two equations that come from the polarization. I have one equation that comes from force balance, and there are two, three things I need to know: h parallel, h perpendicular, and u. So I can play with it, and I get the three things. So as I said, h parallel I don't care. I care about that, and I care about the velocity gradient. So if you do the algebra, the velocity gradient. Go back to zero here, and if I know theta of y, I know the velocity gradient as a function of y. And the other thing that I get in the perpendicular field, that's h curve equals the long theta with value sine two theta times one plus mu one. Over the same denominator, so both will have to have one. But I know what the molecular field is. I told you the molecular field I get by taking the derivative of the free energy with respect to the angle. So, what I showed you yesterday is that if I do it in two dimensions and I assume that the two the Bending moduli are equal, k1 and k3 are equal. The molecular field is just h perpendicular equals k, gradient squared of theta, but theta only depends on y. So it's k d2 theta equals d y squared. So this and this would fix theta. And then if I know theta, I can calculate you. Now the only issue is whether the solution was theta is not zero all the time. So the way we do it is that we look whether there is a solution where theta is small, and then we discuss the equation. So if theta is small, sine two theta is theta, and all the rest can be theta by one. So I assume theta is smaller than one. Or if you want, what I'm kind of doing is I'm looking at the stability of the steady state solution with the motions. K. I write it another way, I will write it d2 theta in y squared plus 
1 over L square and the same time is equal to 0. D to theta d y squares come from here. The theta terms come from here. And all the rest I lump into this 1 over L square, where L is a length. So 1 over L square equals minus Uh, I told you that what I want to consider is an active fluid which is contract time. So it's contract time with my definition zeta delta mu is negative. So 1 over x squared is positive. This is why I chose the sign which is here. So this gives me the length scale of the problem. Essentially, the length scale comes from the comparison between the active stress and this found coefficient here. This is more or less of order one. So then, I have to discuss this equation. And the boundary conditions are here. Theta is equal to zero here. Theta is equal to zero here. So the solution is just theta. Is an odd sine of y over With this choice, I have theta of 0 equals 0. And then I need to impose that theta of e is also equal to 0. So that will tell me that sine of e over n is equal to 0, or if you want, that E is equal to 5. So if E is smaller than pi L, I have no way to satisfy this boundary condition. So if E is smaller than pi L, the only steady state that I have is a trivial one. There is no motion, and the polarization is parallel. larger than pi L, you have a finite solution. You have to work a little bit more. You have to expand this stuff, and you will get a term in theta squared, a term in theta cube. And you will show with that that there is a finite solution. It's exactly like a buckling problem. If you look at the buckling of a beam, you get an equation which is just this one. You have two boundary conditions. You satisfy one, and the buckling solution appears at a critical force. Now, what I'm telling here is that there is a critical thickness was a film start to have a non-homogeneous polarization. So the critical thickness is pi L. If E is smaller than pi L, there's only the trivial solution. If E is larger than pi L, theta equals to theta naught at least close to pi L. Say the not sine y over L. And you can calculate this theta naught by looking at the nonlinear term for chapter. Of course, when E is equal to pi L, theta naught is zero. Can Wait. I ask you a question? I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding, but L is what L is L in this old network that you had yesterday or L is just this length defined by that. But in the in the picture of the network, oh. is it something that we can think of or not? No, no, no. This has it's nothing to do. Nothing to do. Okay. okay, let me call this one LC. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 the question is nice, I didn't think about it. I used L yesterday for something very different, which was the mesh size of the actin filament. This has nothing to do with the mesh size. This is just something given back. Now, if theta is on zero, u is on zero, the velocity gradient is it's negative if theta naught is positive, which means the velocity, which is zero here, will be negative. And if I calculate the flux, 
the liquid spontaneously moves to the left. So there is a spontaneous motion. Of course, it's a dynamic phase transition. So above E equals pi L, I have two choices, plus theta naught and minus theta naught. If I choose plus theta naught, it will move in the negative direction. If I choose minus theta naught, it will move in the positive direction. So what I'm kind of claiming here is that if you take a thin acting film like this, you increase the thickness, and above a critical thickness, it flows spontaneously. What I mean by it flows spontaneously is I have a macroscopic flux of liquid with no pressure gradient. And it flows spontaneously because of the active stress, or if you want, for acting because of molecular motors. Now you can reverse again. You can fix the thickness. You change the activity. And what it tells you is that if you increase the activity above the critical activity, the system will flow. Uh, so how can you, can you look at this kind of qualitatively? Uh, there is. I don't know how much you know about liquid crystals. What are the orders of those length scales, those L's, those critical L's, if you can That's explain. a good question. Uh, so this I know. For instance, from the experiment I showed you the other day, it's like one part of Pascal. Mm -hmm. uh, all this is of order one. Then I would need the Frank coefficients for acting. I don't know the Frank coefficients for acting. So the only thing I can do is play around and see what the Frank coefficients for liquid crystals are and things like this. If I do that, I get microns. So something of the order of microns for LC. So a film with a thickness smaller than a few microns will flow. A film with a thickness larger than a few microns will spontaneously flow. <coughs> so how can you get a qualitative idea of this instability? Uh, there is something in liquid crystals which is called the Frederick's transition. Does anybody know what the Frederick transition is? But this is how your watch, not mine. <laughs> so to have liquid crystal displays work, you take a thin liquid crystal film like this. anchor the orientation of the molecules on the surface. And liquid, liquid crystal people know very well how to do that. So and if you don't do anything, everything is parallel. Then you put a magnetic field. You introduce a magnetic field in this direction. If the magnetic field is too small, nothing happens, <coughs> and the orientation remains parallel. If you need a magnetic field, you can do it with yeah, in this case, it's electric field. You can do it with both. It flows with both. Then you increase of E or B. If you increase E or B enough beyond the critical threshold, in the middle here, the molecules will get parallel to B. So I have a way to flip the orientation from zero to perpendicular. Now, if you look at the equations, the role of B is exactly the same as the role of zeta delta mu. Also, what the active stress does is that it plays the role of a magnetic field that wants to orient the molecules in this direction. And this here is exactly the formula of the Frederick transition for an elliptic liquid crystal. Now there is more to it. And I should be more precise in my point. Central line here. What I tell you is that above the Frederick transition, theta goes like this. So the orientation tilts. So it tilts here, and here it's very tilted, and then it tilts less, and then the top is going to here. So I have an orientation that flips like this, and then it goes back to this. So I have a gradient of orientation. And if I have a gradient of orientation, I have a gradient of active stress. Now something in the balance, or balance equation must balance the gradient of active stress. And the only thing that can do it is viscous stress. So as long as you have a gradient of active stress in any of these active material, the material flows. It flows in such a way that 
the viscous stress exactly balances the active stress. So that's a very general property. Anytime you create a gradient of active stress, the system flows. For instance, I could do it in an even more simpler way, suppose. I decide that here the orientation is parallel, here it's perpendicular. There's no state with zero flow, because there is a gradient of P that must turn from here to here. There is a gradient of P, there is a gradient of active stress, and I need a velocity gradient compensated with gradient of active stress. So these materials are such that any time you create a gradient of orientation, the material flows. My Frederick's transition, this dynamic transition, is a little bit more spectacular because I don't create a gradient. It appears spontaneously. So the system spontaneously breaks symmetry and decides to flow in this direction and in this direction. <coughs> so that's a very general effect. I think in any theory of active system, you have an effect like this, spontaneous flow of the material. What it more or less tells you is that there's no bulk active system which doesn't flow. Anytime you have a landscape which is larger than this one, the system flows. Now, a good example is this material, what I call material turbulence yesterday or two days ago. This drop of bacteria where you saw these eddies. Now, that's another illustration of that. At the length scale larger than what would correspond to that bacteria, the system has to flow. It organizes in the pattern, which is this eddy pattern that you saw. So in a sense, when Jerry was saying that there is a length scale, my claim is that the length scale is something like this. Um, the next point is, I said, this is a spontaneous symmetry bridge. So you can go either to the right or to the left. If you have a pneumatic system, both directions are equivalent. Uh, of course, you can say that it's easy. If I have a polar system, this direction is favored with respect to this one, and I will only have one choice. That's not true. If you add polar terms, the polar terms that I told you yesterday, you still have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and both directions are equivalent to the direction of P in the opposite direction. So what decides the direction of the flow is whether you have a gradient of P that goes up or a gradient of P that goes down. You break symmetry like this, and that fixes the orientation of the flow <coughs> because it fixes the sign of the velocity gradient. Oui. So, go ahead. So that's just because in a stress you just have a you just have an equal term in a stress. So if you put in the higher order a higher order polar term in the stress, then you won't. So, have so what, uh, if I put higher order terms here, yes. so you want me to go beyond the hydrodynamic yes, yeah. That might that yeah. might yeah. fix yeah. the orientation of it. Yeah. Yeah. But if I only put polar terms in this equation, it doesn't do it. Right. Sure. It just saves the transition to Yes? Um, so uh, in this uh, spontaneous motion case, uh, what's the equivalent uh, quantity uh, correspond to the E field or B field? Is that the active stress? It's the active stress. Mm -hmm. So what's the original of that? Well, how do I know that? Because if I look at the force balance equation, it comes with a sine 2 theta. And if you write the equation for the Frederick's condition in an electric field or a magnetic field, it also comes with a sine 2 theta. The prefactor is not B or E, it's B squared or B squared. So you have, just have to write the coupling between a pneumatic order parameter and an external field. It's E squared plus the same sine 2 theta, which is here. So, so the part I don't understand is, uh um, so from uh, 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 static uh, fluids, you have a motion, and so where did you get that kinetic energy? Oh, where do I get the energy? Where do I got this term from? I got this term from saying that I was injecting energy in the form of ATP all the time. Okay. So the energy comes from here. Okay, this is the consumption of ATP. Momentum is conserved because I'm transferring energy to a substrate. So if you take a freestanding field, there is motion, but there is no global flux. So you can change the boundary condition, you can make the two surfaces free, you can make the two surfaces solid. There is always flow, but if you have a freestanding field, it's only a shear. There is no global flux. Here you've imposed that the free surface uh, remains uh, 
flat. But if you release this assumption, what, what happens? So if I release, so that was done. That was done a couple of years ago by Sriram Ramaswamy and Sumitra. Uh, you get further instabilities. So you have instabilities at the surface. So in a sense, what you're saying is that I did as if the surface tension was infinite here. If, if you take a finite surface tension, you get other instability showed up. So you have a pattern on the surface that shows up. Yes? So do you just mind clarifying physically what are the uh, analogous electric and magnetic fields in this case? So the analogous of the magnetic field is that. So that's the active. That's, That's the active stress. Yeah. What I'm saying is the analogous is in the field that it tilts the polarization. If it tilts the polarization, it introduces a gradient of stress, and then I need a velocity gradient. Whatever I do, satisfy both factors. So what I'm saying to you is that an active system, if you take it large enough, it cannot be steady with zero velocity. It has to fit. That's one of the major problems. Is there uh, is there any way that we can make it not flow if we play with the conditions with the active flow? Or you can imagine conditions where the total flux would be zero, that's for sure. Okay. But otherwise, you put a pressure pressure. If you push here against the flow, it would not be good. That's for sure. Uh, you, you said it was, um, there is a complete mapping between this theory and the uh, theory of active particles in the back. So I'm claiming that an effect like this exists for active right. particles. The theory is that 99% are the same, so there is no surprise. In that. Well, so, but there is the, the sign of the, <coughs> of the coefficient of this coefficient. Can so what about if I change the sign? Yeah, if it's there is another instability, which is, is a, the polarization can go out of, out of plane. Mm -hmm. So even if the sign is in the other direction, there is an instability, which I don't prove here. And you have to let the, the polarization go out of place. So I kind of think that this is somehow fundamental experiment. I don't have any experimental verification of that. Nobody ever made an experiment to try to check that, at least to my knowledge. Uh, there are numerical simulations. The group in Edinburgh case mind these different people like this. The lattice Boltzmann simulation of active fluids. And they indeed observe this, this phase transition. But that's not the proof for me yet, that I would like to see as an experiment. So if ever we have ideas on experiments that would check that, they are welcome. The last point is, is this relevant for biological questions? And the answer is I don't know. Uh, in the, I said I would talk about uh, lamellipodia, which are thin, thin to head of cells. Typical thickness of a lamellipodium is a few microns. But I made a guess of what K was. So maybe we're close to the threshold, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know whether this case works. But somehow, intrinsically, I would expect this to be true for any active system. <coughs> so there is one way of uh, stopping it. If you take into account the grad P, grad P transpose term in the stress equation. So Which one? In the stress equation, if you add it, in the stress equation. Uh, sigma. This one, yeah. Sigma. Okay. So if you add a term that goes as grad P plus grad P transpose. Yes. So that's a polar polar term, first active polar term. And if you play around with the two active coefficients, you can kill this. Yeah, I mean, you, you can cancel it. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't tell you an experimental way to cancel it, does it? Because we don't know how to manipulate all these coefficients. So, so that was my first example. But the message of that is that any time you create a gradient of active stress, you reduce it. Uh, so what I want to do now is completely change gear, and I want to talk about the portable acting layer. Cells, 
just below the cell membranes, you have a very thin sheet of actin, which is a sheet of actin gel plus minus it. So that's a layer. about something between 0.5 micron <coughs> to 1 micron. It's just below the cell membrane. And for my purpose here, but that's mostly true, it's an actin gel with, with my single motion. Exactly what I call an acting uh, Well, there are a few other things that people know about that. But let me assume that they, I forget about curvature, so I'm going to make the cell membrane flat. So we fill in the cell membrane. What's known is that the actin filament polymerize from the membrane. So they grow here. What I call the plus sign is here, and they grow from the membrane. And they're almost parallel to the membrane. So it's something like this. The angle is very small, on average, and they grow from here. So all the time you inject actin from the surface. The reason why you inject actin from the surface is that there are protein in the membrane from like chromium or actin polymerization promoter that promotes the polymerization of actin in this region. So what I want to do is try to make an extremely naive model on what is the thickness of this actin layer and what does it depend on. Now people know other things. They know that the filaments are pretty much parallel to the membrane, but they know that there is no orientation in the plane. What I mean by that is what I call the average polarization <coughs> is perpendicular to the plane. <coughs> so in the plane there is rotational symmetry and there is small inclination upwards, so the average polarization is something like this. Then I have to talk about contractility. The contractility in the cell is along the filament. So it contracts like this and it dilates like this. What this means is that in terms of my active stress, if I decide that the polarization is in this direction, this zeta delta mu for this problem is possible. Or if you want to describe it in terms of pneumatic liquid crystals, this would correspond to a pneumatic order parameter which is negative and putting a negative all the parameters, consider that as possible. So I will assume in all of the following that zeta and mu is positive. Now the next, next assumption that I will make, where I will again define an axis C in this direction, X in this direction, is that zeta that mu depends on z. Now why? Suppose I polymerize a little bit here. If I polymerize here, I make new actin filament, and this actin filament doesn't have molecular motors in it. And then there's a kinetics of binding of the molecular motors of the actin filament. So the further you go, the longer time you let the actin filament to, to absorb. And there's some kind of transient between zero density of myosins and the finite density of myosins. Now, if you write the first order rate kinetics, what you will get is something like zeta delta mu equals a constant of the zeta delta mu r and one minus an exponential over the velocity, which is the polarization velocity, times the time, which is the binding time of the, of the binding motors. So the further I go in the layer, the more contractile the layer is, and the stress 
that in this direction is larger. Now, if there is stress in this direction, if there is tensile stress, you activate depolymerization. So the, further, the higher the layer, the lower the depolymerization. And at some point, you will reach a depolymerization that exactly compensates polymerization, and that will fix the sequence of the layer. So that's the mechanism that I want to, that I want to take into account. So I will do it in a very naive way. I will call BP the polymerization velocity. And I will assume that depolymerization only occurs on the upper surface. That's not exactly true. There is depolymerization in the bulk here. But that's much easier to treat, and it seems that the result that you obtain like this is not too bad. So if you want to improve this model, and we are currently trying to do that, you have to be more, more careful about depolymerization. What I want to do here is just give you a trend of what happens and what, what this cortical layer is used for. So that's kind of an extremely naive description of the layer that I have. And now what I want to do is calculate the sequence. So I will treat that as an active film. I will assume that it's smaller and the size where it becomes unstable here to avoid the instability. I'll show you how I recommend the sequence. I don't care about the amplitude, I can scale it out. So this won't play any role. The tensor for the polar tensor, Q alpha beta, is just P alpha P beta. Now, yesterday I said minus one third delta alpha beta because I wanted the zero trace. I will do it in three dimensions, so I will put minus one half. Do it in three dimensions. So this tensor is just so on x is minus a half. Zero. Then the problem is simpler than the previous one because I don't need an equation for the polarization. The polarization is a long key. So the only thing I need is force balance. So what's false balance? Again, I will assume that everything is invariant with respect to x. I will write the false balance in the z direction. Oh, 
I want to be more subtle than that. I don't want to consider it as a liquid. I want to consider a viscoelastic system. I have to go back and make it viscoelastic. So this is a, the, the stress, this is the active stress, this is the viscous dissipation, and this is my Maxwell mod. The only stresses which are not zero are sigma xx and sigma zz. So I want to write this, those are sigma xx and sigma zz. So it's one. So sigma xx. These are the constitutive equations of the system. So then I need the velocity. Now why is there a velocity? Because I'm polymerizing on this surface, acting those up, and depolymerizes on the upper surface. So the velocity is along z. And in two dimensions like this, the incompressibility equation is just vz, vz equals zero. So vz is constant. But why do I have vz? Because I polymerize here. So vz is just a polymerization velocity. So, so what you're saying is that maybe you don't play any role, but I should see it is don't play any role. You agree with me? Yeah. Um, so if they don't play any role, you're right. You will see it. <laughs> okay. But I just wanted to show you that I didn't introduce that for fun in some cases. It's not obvious. I mean, the turnover time and the typical times are kind of the same order of magnitude. So the time to be new, the cortical layer, and the viscoelastic time are more or less of the same order of magnitude. It's like a half a million. Now I want a steady state. There is no vorticity in this problem. So this is very simple. So it's just one plus V P R of sigma xx minus
what fixes the stresses. And I have to combine that with the force balance equation, which is here. Now, the total stress, sigma is easy. There is no anti symmetric stress in this problem, so there is no fear. It's just the viscous stress plus the pressure. So this equation is just sigma z z minus p is equal to q1. Sigma z z is equal to p. If I solve for sigma z z here, I know the pressure. I solve for sigma x x here. And I can calculate sigma x, x, sigma z, z, and the pressure. Now I need boundary conditions. So what are the boundary conditions? For the z component of the stress, there is no pressure here. So sigma zz minus p is equal to zero. I need a boundary condition for the x component of the stress. Or if you want, sigma x x minus p is equal to zero. So you can solve for the stresses, and the only thing that we care about is sigma x x minus p. This is just zeta, delta, nu, bar. With the x component of the stress minus the pressure, so the total x component of the stress is just the active stress. back to the Sebastian question, you see that the viscoelastic relaxation time has gone away in this equation because of this boundary condition that I chose. So if I look what it means here, I create actin on the surface. It's taken up by the polymerization and depolymerizes on the upper surface. But when it goes up, I build up this stress here in the x dimension, so I pull on the actin surface. Now, my claim is that if I pull on the actin filament, I enhance depolarization. Wait, um, why, why do we expect it to be incompressible? Why do we expect it to be incompressible? That's a very good question. Now, if you consider an actin gel, people have measured the Poisson ratio. People like Sapman have done that. It's always larger than 0.4 or 0.45. So it's never a bad approximation to assume that it's incompressible. Except if you squeeze it. Of course, if you take an active gel and you squeeze it, you will expel the solvent. Right. But if you don't go to this geometry where you expel the solvent, an active gel is more or less incompressible. Almost any polymer gel is incompressible. But, no, but this one has a very particular orientation, right? yeah. because you know, they're all low angle on the surface. So this is a kind of question. This is again the reason why I was saying that my theory would be extremely naive. We could introduce things like this, but I wanted to make it as simple as possible. But for usual active gels, the Poisson modulus is larger than 0.4 or 0.5. So it's almost 0.5. Other question here? Could you like, uh, release this boundary condition? Like, uh, so so I, could change, I could change this boundary condition. So why would I change it? Friction. I said, suppose, suppose that there is friction between the, the monomers and the gel when I make it. Mm -hmm. Then I would have to make it more complicated. 
And then you need to consider the flow. And so then I need to consider the flow, and then it will depend on the discrete elasticity and things like this. But yes, if I, but then I will need a very detailed description of what happens on the surface, which is something that I don't know. Yes? Good question. So, did the flow properties change because. I don't hear you. Did the flow properties change because they're going from small monomers to large polymers? Oh, so yes, I have a viscosity here. And this is the viscosity of the polymer system. So, this is huge compared to the monomeric uh, solution. So, what about the osmotic? So, what is the order of magnitude of that? I'm using a Maxwell model. So the viscosity is like the elastic modulus times the viscoelastic relaxation time. The elastic modulus is 1,000 pascal. The viscoelastic relaxation time is something like 100 seconds, so it's like 10 to the 5. That's eight orders of magnitude larger than the viscosity of water. Now, if I take active monomers in solution, the viscosity is the viscosity of water or twice the viscosity of water. What about the osmotic forces? What? So, why did I get rid of osmotic forces? Just because I assumed the gel was incompressible. Well, oh, because you went from many, many, many small molecules to a large one. So I make a gel like this, and I assume the gel is incompressible, so there is no gradient in osmotic pressure. I just ignore that. What he wanted me to do is make the gel compressible. If I make the gel compressible, I would have to add gradient in osmotic pressure. And that's pretty messy. And I need a model for that as well. Although for acting, you, you know things like that. Okay? So, this is a stress distribution. Now, what I want to consider is depolymerization. I will go there. depolymerization velocity dt. <laughs> and what I want to say is that if I increase the tensile stress, it depolymerizes faster. I'm stripping the gel and it depolymerizes faster. So this depends on the total tensile stress with sigma x x minus p and z equals e. Now the way I will write that down is I will say dt equals dp0 times an exponential of this stress. Exponential of sigma x s. Now, why do I write it like this? Suppose you take an actin filament and you pull on it. If you pull on an actin filament, you will increase the depolymerization rate. You can make models for that. You can make models like Kramer's rate theory. And that always leads to exponential variation. So the naive guess is that if I increase the stress, I increase the depolarization velocity. If E gets larger, this will increase, and the depolarization velocity will become smaller and smaller. So that's what I will need. Now I want to describe a steady state. polymerization velocity is exactly equal to the depolymerization velocity. So the steady state condition is just at dp equals dd. And I'm going to take that, so it's dd0. Sigma x, x. 
Now V T is fixed, the polymerization velocity. V T0 I know. It's a depolymerization velocity in the absence of stress. Sigma xx minus v, this is what I calculated. So that fixes the sequence. Well, you can work out the algebra. There's nothing <coughs> difficult to that. So you just write the answer for the sickness. The answer is E equals minus V tau N logarithm of 1 minus G sigma 0. Where I define G equals logarithm. Now this G must be positive, because if, I if, if in the absence of stress, I depolymerize more than I polymerize, there's no cortical there. So in the absence of stress, I want to polymerize more than I depolymerize. And this G here is something positive. So it's log of 1 minus something positive. Now I want to plot that as a function of Delta delta mu, so as a function of the activity of the nucleus. If the activity is very large, this goes to zero, it's log of one, so the sickness becomes zero. There is a sickness here where this is equal to one, and I get log of zero, and the sickness becomes infinite. So it's something like this. This is theta delta mu equals g So this is the thickness of the cortical layer as a function of the active stress of the molecular motors. Now suppose the active stress of the molecular motors is very low. If the active stress of the molecular motors is very low, the depolymerization velocity is almost the depolymerization velocity in the absence of stress. It's smaller than the polymerization velocity. So I polymerize and I don't depolymerize, and the cortical layer I made that. So below this region, I have an infinite cortical layer because depolymerization is not nothing. If I increase the stress of molecular motors, I increase the stress here that decreases the, that increases the depolymerization velocity, and the sickness becomes smaller and smaller. Now the natural scale is this v speed tau m, which is here. And if you want, this tau m in principle is very small. So if you want something of order one micron, you're somewhere here. So very close to the place where it starts to go. So this very nice model, what it tells you is that because of this coupling between depolymerization and stresses, the thickness of the cortical layer is essentially controlled by the active stresses due to the molecular motors. Now there's a last thing I want to show you, which is I want to talk about the tension in the layer. Essentially what I've been telling you is that as I go up in the layer, I build up tensile stress. So the tensile stress is zero here and increases and increases and increases. Now if there's a tensile stress like this, it means that there's a tension in the layer. So the layer tension, T, is just the integral over the thickness of the stress in this direction, so it's sigma x, x minus T. Tension is just the integral of the stress. But if I'm close to this region, where E is large compared to Vp tau n, if you calculate this integral, what you find is that it's just zeta delta mu times 
So what I'm saying here is that <coughs> the motors try to contract this layer. This is equivalent to a surface tension. And the surface tension is what you would naively guess. It's the stress due to the motors times the thickness of the layer. Now in a cell, what it means is that in addition to the membrane tension, you have a tension which is due to the cortex. Now if you put numbers into that, what you find that is that this is much larger than the tension of the membrane. what you would like to do is how do you measure the cell tension. Now there is an extremely simple experiment to measure it. So you take a cell. And then you break the pipette here, the glass pipette. And then you apply a negative pressure. If the pressure is small, nothing happens. If the pressure is large, you will make some kind of tongue here, and the cell will enter the pipette. Now of course, here, the force balance must be satisfied. So this delta P must be the pressure inside the cell plus the Laplace pressure. So if I introduce the radius here that I can call B, delta P is 2T over B. So how do I do the experiment? You put the pipette in contact with the cell, you increase the aspiration, and you measure the point where the cell starts to go in. The point where the cell starts to go in is exactly given by this condition. And that gives the tension of the cell. Now if you do that, what you find is that this is something like 10 to T. 10 to the minus 3 newtons per meter. If you look at the membrane, it's something like two orders of magnitude small. So it's 10 to the minus 5 newtons per meter. And that cannot be due to the membrane, because if you take a membrane at this tension, you just explode it. So that's the prediction of this kind of naive model. What I want to do now is kind of show you what we did with that and what kind of problems we looked at with that. Wait, question. You consider it a uh, flat cortex. I guess. Uh, in reality, it's, it's, not, it's not flat, so it's curved. And then uh, P is not fixed uh, anymore and you have some splay, uh, how does it influence... So what you're saying is that I shouldn't believe the theory like this. I should consider a curved membrane and redo the theory for the cortical layer for a curved membrane. And consider the splay of the... Yes. Does it change much? The it doesn't change very much, and we look at it. What do you think probably if you have a depolymerization depending on concentration? Depolymerization depending on concentration. What do you mean by that? So basically, if you write down a concentration equation, if you write down a concentration equation, yes, and try to figure out, okay, so wherever the concentration of the I is, like this one, concept, write down a concentration equation, and then in the concentration equation, you introduce a. So you are saying I should be more careful because in the cell, there is a given concentration of actin. And the constant polymerization velocity that I use is the polymerization velocity at the right concentration of actin. Right. So yes, in principle, we should, in principle, we should do that. Now, the concentration of free actin in the cell, which means, which means of monomer actin in the cell, is pretty half. Half of the actin is in the form of monomer actin. So I think the cortical layer doesn't eat much of it. Okay. So what you're saying is when I polymerize monomers of actin, they come to the filament in an ATP form and then they get hydrolyzed. Uh, now that counts a little bit, 
that will affect these parameters that I call sigma and out here, which is order of magnitude I haven't talked about at all. So you can do morons or actin filaments on the force and see what this uh, hydrolysis question does. And yes, it changes the force that uses the, the active filament depolymerase. The story is that it depolymerizes much faster if it's in an ATP form than it's within an ATP form. So you shift the equilibrium and then you reach more, the, more faster than the ATP form and it depolymerizes. So in this model, if you didn't have um, an active plus, if you didn't have a polymerization and depolymerization, you just had um, this incompressible cortical layer, would that affect that sort of tension measurement? So, so what I'm okay. So what I'm claiming is what you're saying is suppose I only have the cortical layer with molecular motors. Then if the density is constant, I will get something like this. I will get uh, an active sorry. I lost my stuff. I, I, I would get an active tension, tension due to the cortical layer, which is a stress in the layer integrated over the thickness. Now, the naive guess is that whatever you do, you should get something like this. The thickness of the layer times the activity. Now, how do you check that? You measure the tension, here's a method that I showed you here, and then you change the activity of the molecular motors. People know how to do that. They have drugs that inhibit molecular motors or make them more active. And if you do that, indeed you change the tension of the motor. So you can multiply it by three or four. Without the molecular motors, does it Without reduce? the molecular motors, there's no tension. So does it reduce the membrane volume? Oh, then, of course, then it reduces the membrane tension. But I, as I said, the membrane tension is something like two or three orders of magnitude more. So yes, but in this case, you just measure the membrane. And people see that. So, so what I want to do to conclude that is show you a few systems that we have studied which are related to cortical layers. Now the first experiment that we have studied is these experiments on cells which are done by these collaborators that we have called Pramod Pularka. Uh, this is cell which is called a fibroblast cell, never mind. The only thing which has been done to this cell is that it's not allowed to attach to any surface. So all the surfaces in the experiment have been treated in such a way that the cell doesn't attach to any surface. And then what Palmer did is he just wash his cell, and here's what he does. It oscillates. And it oscillates, some of these cells would oscillate for this one oscillates for an hour. What are those spikes? The, Where is? There are some spikes out of the, around this. Oh, well, this? Yeah. I don't know. What you can see is that there are kind of waves turning around, that's for sure. Uh, are Islamic borders? This, 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 this would be, I don't know, yeah, things like this protrusion from the cell, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> so what he did afterwards is that he took one direction and he measured the radius in this direction. There actually, there is uh, some problem with the GFT leveling. That could mean. Uh, and, and here is a radius in one direction. You see that there is a long time drift, but there is a well defined period. So if you take a Fourier spectrum of that, you have a period of 27 seconds or something like this. Uh, of course, then you want to know what creates these oscillations. And of course, it has to do with actin and myosins that I'm going to show you. So if you inhibit the myosins, so you destroy the myosins, the cell stops to oscillate. If you destroy the actin complex by adding another drug, the cell stops to oscillate. Now it's known that in these cells, actin is mostly at the cortex. 
So what this kind of means is that this instability that we see here is an instability of the corticoactin layer. There is another thing though. That there is another variable are not changed. It changes the calcium concentration in the external medium. Now if you decrease the calcium concentration in the external medium, you also stop the oscillation. So what it means is that and any other parameter that he changed, he didn't do anything. So what it tells us is that what's important in there is actin, myosin, and calcium. Now, we made a model for that, and I certainly don't want to go into the model. The first thing you can do is you can look at the stability of the postponer. So you do what Hervé was wanting me to do. You do that in circle geometry, you look at the stability, and indeed it's unstable. But it never shows oscillations. If you want to see oscillations, you have to include calcium. So the way we did that is we assumed that there were calcium channels here, and that the calcium channels are coupled to the tension in the cortical layer. When the tension is large, the channels are open, calcium goes in, and if calcium goes in, it activates the motors. So there is a feedback of calcium on the tension, and this feedback creates the oscillations. Of course, then you want to check that. Uh, the good way to check that is to block the calcium channels. So we don't know what the calcium channels are, but are not new drugs that are supposed to block any calcium channels. If you block this, the channels with these drugs, the oscillation stops. So what I would say is that this oscillation is uh, an instability of the cortical layer, which is where there is a feedback to the entrance end input and output of calcium from the cell. So that's the kind of model that we made. We will produce more or less a period like this, and we also find an oscillation period that increases with my So that's the first question we looked at. The second question we looked at is what people call blurbs. I don't know if any of you saw pictures like this. Uh, this, is a cell. this one is in a bad shape. It's currently dying. And what you see here is big membrane protrusions, protrusions where the membrane detaches from the cortex. Now, here is some kind of enlargement in another experiment of these regions. What's labeled in green here is the cortical layer. It's the myosin motors which are labeled in green. What's labeled in red is a membrane. And here is the formation of the blood. So the membrane detaches from the cortical layer. And the cortical layer depolymerizes, and you get a blood like this. The blood lives for one minute or half a minute or something like this. Then actin comes back here, and the blood returns. And then you can make a blood at another place. Now, why do you make a blood? Because in all of this region, the cell has a tension which is very large. It's a tension of the membrane plus the cortical layer. But in the bleb, there is only the membrane. So at the maximum size for the bleb goes in, you have equilibrium, the pressure here, which is just the blast pressure due to that, and the pressure inside the cell, which is the blast pressure due to the membrane tension, cortical layer plus membrane. Now if you use ideas like this, you can kind of calculate the size of the bleb, and you can compare quantitatively to its power. You need the tension, and you can measure it independently. So in this experiment, you even have directly the tension that you need, and you can make quantitative measurements. So that's another problem that we study in this course Question? Yes? Is the membrane inextensible? Is the membrane? Inextensible? Inextensible. No. Uh, of course, if you do a blend, you need to increase the membrane area. Now, people tell you that there are reservoirs of membrane or there are vesicles coming. So if you want to look at the kinetics of formation of the blend, you need to figure out where the membrane comes from. There are fluctuations in the membrane. So at least you could get some areas from the, some area from the fluctuations. So you increase the tension of the membrane and you make areas. Now, how did, was the experiment that we studied done? If you have to show that. What these people figured out is a way to reduce the blood. So in principle, the blood come in by nucleation, and they come in anywhere. The idea that they had is that 
if you can destroy at a given point the cortex, then at this, at this point when you destroy the cortex, you can close that. The way they do it is they use a laser beam and they photoablate the cortex. And at this place where you photoablate the cortex, you make a gap. Maybe I show it again. Anyway, what happened here is that at this place here, they shown the laser, and when they shine the laser, the cortex is destroyed, and then the blood forms at the place where you shine the laser. That's very nice because it allows you to make quantitative experiments where you, where you know time zero. So that's the second thing that we studied. Um, the third type of questions which are associated with cortex that we studied we what I call the formation of contractile rings. When a cell divides, at the end of the cell division, you need to separate the two daughter cells. This process is called cytokinesis. Now, the way it happens is that here at this place, in the middle, there is a ring of actin that forms. Now, if you look in biology textbooks, what I tell you is that the first stage is that there is an increase of the myosin density at this point. Now, if there is an increase of the myosin density at this point, it means that the active stress is larger at this point. It's larger at the equator than it is at the pole. There is a gradient of active stress. And then, as I told you before, if you have a gradient of active stress, there is a flow. So there is a cortical flow that goes from the core to the equator. The cortical flow is coupled to the orientation of the actin filament. The actin filament goes perpendicular to the flow, and that what starts the formation of the air. So just using the ideas, purely mechanical ideas that I give you here, is the density of myosin motors is increased close to the equator here. That leads to the formation of an actin ring. So actin ring are observed in cell cytokinesis. They are observed during development, and these are not pictures of cells. This is the first division of the embryo of a C. elegans. And people in Dresden are working a lot on that. People can also make wounds in the cell. So they do the same kind of photoablation that I talked about. You make a hole in the cortex, and in some cases, the, the, the hole just heals. And it heals because there is formation of, a, of an actin ring around the so it's the same kind of phenomena. If you increase the density of myosin at any point, you create gradients of active stresses. Gradients of active stresses induces flow, and the flow modifies the orientation of the actin filament because of this coupling between flow and orientation that I talked about. So I want to stop here. That gives you some kind of rough idea of the things that we are doing with quantum So um, I always come across when I read the literature that when a cell spreads out, we have the proliferation of the cytosol in the periphery, the polarizes there. There's proliferation of what? So when a cell, a cell spreads out, yes. we have polymerization of the cytosol in the periphery. Yes. But then you talk about a ret retrograde flow, so the acting like going out, and then there's a retrograde flow inside. So I was wondering if you... So, yes, so this was my third topic for the retrograde flow. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll show you these movies. Uh, the, the experiments that we studied are not the ones you're talking about, but I think we have to do the same. So we studied the notion of the cells, which are called keratocyte cells. These are cells of the skin, and these ones come from fish. So the way they are done is that they took squades, and the fish, they put them, put them down in the petri dish, and these cells go down and they start moving. These cells move very fast. Very fast means 10 micrometers per minute, something like this. And you just see them advancing like this. Uh, so if you look at this picture, there are two regions in this cell. There is this big flat region here, which is called the lamellipodium. And this is mostly actin and myosin. And then there is a big bump here 
And this big bump includes everything the cell needs to live. It includes the nucleus, it includes uh, all the cell functions are included in So when the cell moves, what drives the cell forward is this laminitoli. There's another experiment. So these are experiments done in Switzerland. This kind of a costume. You add a drug, and when you add a drug, you can cut a small piece of the laminitoli. So it spreads, it makes some kind of flat pancake in here. It stays on the surface, and it stays here for at least a half hour, maybe more. And then there's this experiment that I find fantastic. So this is just what I was telling you. So this is a small fragment of cells that has been cut from the laminate body. So where it comes. And then we come with a pipette here. It blows in the pipette, it breaks the symmetry, and the fragment moves. Uh, and the fragment only has actin and myosin. So what it means is that the only thing you need to move is actin and myosin. I was kind of fascinated by this experiment. Uh, we still don't have a full explanation. The only thing that we can do is we take a small pancake of actin and myosin, and then you can look at the stability of that, and you can map that into a viscous filament pump. So that at least tells you why it's unstable. I don't have any explanation on how it moves and how it performs. And then on these keratocyte cells, people did a whole bunch of experiments. In particular, they did what you want, which means they measured the velocity. So they have a method which is called speckle microscopy. And in the speckle microscopy, uh, you can get the velocity of the actin at each point. That's in the lab reference frame. And the result is here, so I don't know if you see anything. But at this point, the, the arrows are pointing downwards. The cell is moving in this direction. This is this big stuff called the cell bodies that I showed. The arrows are pointing in this direction. So the cell moves like this, and the actin goes in the other direction. Now, why does it do so? How does the cell advance? Essentially, it advances by polymerization. So it polymerizes here, and this polymerizes somewhere like that. Now, if you polymerize here, you don't create, you don't create an intermersity field. You just add matter at it. So if there were only polymerization, you would see an advancing velocity, which is something like the polymerization velocity. However, in here you have myosins. So what myosins do is that they want to contract this, uh, this lamella. And if it contracts, it creates a flow inward. So what I would claim is that the global motion of the cell is due to polymerization, but the local retrograde flow is due to myosin contractility. And there's a big difference in the scales of the velocity. The advancing velocity is something like 10 micrometers per minute. The retrograde flow is something like 1 micrometer per minute. And this is where we get, so we have a model which just applies the same kind of ideas. We can calculate the retrograde flow, then we compare it to that, and this is how we get the active stress. So thank you for this question, which is just <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much.